Tonight I'm going to show you a documentary that our television department has prepared on Thailand. It's primarily uh, about the king and queen of Thailand, and the title of it is More Than a Monarch. The BBC of London had made a documentary of Thailand, and the king and queen were very much disappointed in it. They weren't pleased with it at all. And they gave our television people uh, full latitude to go anywhere. I think they even provided military, ter military uh, helicopters for them to go wherever they needed. And they were very courteous to us. And I think they appreciate what we've been doing for them. Incidentally, the Queen of Thailand is, uh, at least it's official as of this time, that she will be here for eight days in March. She will be a guest here for eight days. She'll be our guest. Now, we've never had a reigning king or queen on our campus. We've had a king here before, but he had by that time abdicated and was no longer actually reigning. And that was, of course, King Leopold III of Belgium, who died just about a year ago now. But this will be the first time we've had a reigning uh, royal personage on the campus that is going to concern the United States government and giving her security and protection, and we'll have to work it out with the State Department. And it's, it's really going to be quite a project. She's going to bring quite a little entourage with her. I think there will be 30 or 40 others with her. So I hope she may speak to you and that you may, many of you, see her. She is going to speak from this platform at least once. And I think she is going to have an exhibit here while she is here. After we saw this documentary, we were very much impressed that this gave us quite an insight into what we're all going to have to be doing in the millennium. At the beginning of the millennium, we're going to find much of the world in the same condition that this king and queen found so many of their population in the highlands, and the, uh, the uh, hell tribes who are nomads, and they don't live in permanent homes. They're absolutely uneducated. They have no knowledge whatsoever. Uh, there is no education. And you'll see a great deal about it in the film and how the king and the queen work with them and help them. And it does give us a little insight into what we're going to have to do in the millennium. I want to say a few words after it. It doesn't last a full hour and a half. I'll have a chance to come back and say a few words after you've seen the film. The following is an Ambassador Foundation presentation. Bangkok, capital city of the Kingdom of Thailand, 
a teeming city of five million people. The sidewalks are crowded with shoppers and vendors. Ancient and modern, east and west, mix easily in the busy streets. The mighty Chao Praia River, bustling with ferries, rice barges, and the merchant ships of all nations, connects Bangkok to the Gulf of Thailand. In this city that was once known as the Venice of the East, the old canals are now being filled in to make way for new roads, modern arteries of a modern city. In the last half of the 20th century, Bangkok has become a crossroad of Asia and one of the great cities of the world. It is the pulsating heart of Thailand today. But at the heart of this city, with its traditional architecture as a striking contrast to the new buildings, is the Grand Palace of the Thai Kings. The carefully restored and lovingly cared for halls and temples are a reminder of another time. The hectic pace of modern Bangkok seems far away. Visitors marvel at the ornate buildings, intricate carvings, and gilded spires and pagodas that bring to life the long and colorful history of the Siamese, or Thai people. But the Grand Palace is more than a monument to Thailand's past. It also stands as a symbol of the nation's present and its future. May 5th, 1950, young Prince Pumipon Adulyade is crowned Rama IX in the Grand Palace at Bangkok. He places the crown upon his head and makes the first official pronouncement of his reign. We shall reign with righteousness for the benefit and happiness of the Siamese people. The people greeted the new king and his beautiful young queen with love and respect. In 1950, while much of Southeast Asia was convulsed in civil war and revolution, the people of Thailand had remained unswerving in their loyalty and affection to their monarch. The Thai throne had remained a stable and unifying institution in the turbulent and changing world of Asia after World War II. King Pumipon still reigns in Thailand. Every year, the entire nation celebrates his birthday as its national day. At the Royal Plaza in Bangkok, the king reviews the regiments of the Royal Guards in the ceremony of Trooping the Colors. As the ranks of the elite royal regiments march by the review stand, led by their commanding officer, Crown Prince Maha Wajiralongkorn, they salute the king and queen. King Pumipon is an active constitutional monarch. The king, Queen Sirikit, and their children, Crown Prince Maha Wajralongkorn, Princess Maha Chakri Sirinton, 
Princess Chulapon, and King Pumipon's mother, Princess Mahida of Songkla, along with many other members of the royal family, play a very active role in their nation's affairs. Not only in ceremonial affairs of state, but in practical acts of service that touch the lives of all Thai people. There exists a very special relationship between the monarchy and the people of Thailand. The Thais have always honored their kings, but the nine kings of the House of Chakri hold a very special place in the hearts of their people and in the history of Thailand. Until the middle of the 18th century, the capital of Thailand was Ayutthaya. Great and powerful kings ruled here. Ayutthaya was widely renowned as a commercial and cultural center. European traders wrote home reports that this was the most beautiful city in the East. However, in 1767, during a period of internal strife, Ayutthaya fell to an invading army. It was a serious setback to the Thai people. But within 10 months, the Thais rallied under a new leader, King Daksin the Great, who pushed the invaders back and recaptured Ayutthaya. But the once proud city was now a charred ruin, a desolate, empty shell. After the death of King Daksin in 1782, the crown was offered to a popular hero, General Chakri. General Chakri became known as King Rama I. He established a new capital for the nation at Bangkok, then just a small village on the Chao Praya River. Rama I set about to make Bangkok a city that would restore to his people the splendor that was once Ayutthaya. Although he had to spend much of his reign battling his nation's enemies, he also determined to preserve the ancient heritage that so nearly perished in the destruction of Ayutthaya. He reorganized the old laws and reestablished the Buddhist faith and literature. When the old warrior king died in 1809, he had made great strides toward restoring his nation's morale and setting it back on the path of progress. His son, Rama II, and grandson, Rama III, followed him to the throne. During their reigns, Thai music, literature, and the other fine arts continued to flourish. Strong trading links were re-established with other Asian and European powers, making the country rich and prosperous. When Rama III died, the crown passed to his younger brother, Prince Mungkut, who became Rama IV. King Mungkut was self-trained as a scientist and a scholar. He learned English and Latin from a missionary and encouraged the children of the courtiers to become familiar with Western ways. During this period, the neighboring nations of Thailand became colonies of the European empires. But largely because of the diplomacy of King Mungkut, the Thais were able to preserve their freedom. After King Mungkut's death, his eldest son, Prince Chulalongkorn, was crowned Rama V and reigned until 1910. He was to have a great impact on Thailand's future. He traveled extensively in Asia and Europe, and from these travels formed ideas for modernizing his nation. He reorganized the educational system and sent his sons to study abroad and establish personal contacts with the crowned heads of Europe. He also organized the infrastructure of a modern state, including Thailand's first railroad and the telegraph and postal system. King Chulalongkorn also began the practice of traveling to all parts of Thailand to see for himself the condition of his people. Often traveling incognito, he made many journeys to remote areas, gaining first-hand knowledge and experience. By the time King Chulalongkorn died in 1910, he had led Thailand wisely into the 20th century. 
His son Rama VI continued to modernize Thailand during his 15-year reign. He was succeeded by his youngest brother, Prince Prachatipo, who immediately began to lay down the foundations of democratic government. In 1932, as Rama VII, he promulgated a new constitution and thereby changed his position to a constitutional monarch. Due to failing health, he abdicated in 1934. His 10-year-old nephew, Prince Ananta Mahidon, was next in line. This popular young king's reign was cut short by his untimely death in 1946. He was succeeded by his younger brother, Prince Pumipon Adulyadeh. Prince Pumipon was born in 1927 in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the United States of America while his father was studying public health at Harvard University. He is the only reigning monarch ever to be born on American soil. After ascending the throne in 1946, the young king continued his education in Switzerland. He married Mom Rachawang Sirikit Kittyakon one week before his official coronation in 1950. The royal couple returned once more to Switzerland to continue their preparation for a life of service to their people. As Rama IX, King Pumipon Adunyade followed in the tradition of the great Chakri kings. Each of the kings had shown great foresight in understanding how to use his position to best serve the Thai people and build the nation. King Pumipon, Rama IX, was no exception. In 1952, he visited the northeast provinces of Thailand for the first time. As he talked to the people in the villages, he gained insight into the needs of the farmers. He then realized that the urgent task of his reign would be to strengthen the rural people. Away from the urban sprawl of Bangkok, Thailand is still a rural nation. Over 80% of Thailand's 50 million population are farmers. Agriculture is the backbone of the economy. Thailand is among the world's major exporters of rice, tapioca, and rubber. But many of these hard-working families are not yet able to fully share in their nation's growing prosperity. Although Thailand does not have the desperate poverty that blights some other developing countries, many families lack adequate education and training. Some are landless and deeply in debt. The rural people live as they always have, planting and harvesting their crops and looking to the land to supply their basic needs. But they cannot stand still in the changing world. Even the most remote corners of Thailand have begun to feel the impact of the 20th century. The rural people are conservative and slow to change. They are often unwilling to take advantage of modern agricultural techniques that would improve their crop yields and allow them to fully participate in Thailand's development. As King Pumipon recognized the needs of the rural people, he realized that the way to help was not to undermine the conservative rhythm of Thai life. However, even though the rural people might be suspicious of change, they would trust their king. To them, King Pumipon was the focal point of all that is Thai, the language, religion, even the land itself. They would trust him to lead them along the right path of progress. And so the king and queen, with other members of the royal family, have continued the tradition begun by the great King Chulalongkorn, traveling thousands of miles every year to all parts of their kingdom helping Thailand's rural population build a secure and prosperous future. 
From King Pumipon's desire to help the rural farmer has come the outstanding achievement of his reign. Hundreds of local development projects undertaken through royal initiative. Here in the north of Thailand, a new dam has been completed, enclosing a reservoir for irrigation. The king had encouraged this reservoir to be built, knowing that a regular water supply will greatly increase the productivity of the local farmland. Now it is finished, and King Pumipon and Queen Sirikit have come with their daughter, Princess Maha Chakri Sirindong, for a personal inspection. It is to be more than just a ceremonial visit. They have come to release over 100,000 small fish and freshwater prawns into the waters of the new reservoir. The fish will breed, and once the reservoir is fully stocked, the people will have a valuable additional source of protein, adding to the benefit that the irrigation waters will bring. This reservoir is not large, but it will have a great impact on the life of this part of the kingdom. Their Majesty's personal involvement has impressed on the local people the benefit the new development will bring. The King works together with the government officials and the people to develop the country. Each one of the development projects is designed to serve the needs of a particular area. The Agricultural Research and Development Center at Khao Hin Son is located on land that was originally donated to the king to be used as a site for a palace. But King Pumipon realized that this land at Khao Hin Son occupied an important position on the edge of the central plain. He decided that the land would be better used to establish a research and development center specifically to help solve the problems facing farmers of the area. This potentially fertile and productive part of the country is in danger of becoming a wasteland. The rainfall is adequate, but the lack of natural catchment areas makes water and soil conservation important. Without skillful management, the soil dries out and becomes depleted. The local farmers didn't know how to take advantage of the lie of the land when plowing to increase water catchment. The easy to grow cassava plant, from which tapioca is derived, was the only crop to be cultivated. Cassava is an undemanding plant from the farmer's point of view, but it rapidly depletes the soil of nutrients. At the research station at Khao Hin Song, many experiments are in progress to show local farmers how water catchment, storage, and irrigation techniques can preserve the productivity of the land. Farmers are taught to sow a crop of peanuts after each crop of cassava. The peanuts restore nitrogen to the soil and help maintain its fertility. Once a supply of water is assured, fruit trees can be cultivated. The lessons learned at Khao Hin Son are passed on to local farmers through an extension program. They are encouraged to form cooperatives. By pooling their resources, the community can soon become self-reliant and self-supporting. Around Khao Hin Son, other dams and irrigation canals have been established, and this area is now able to produce a much greater variety of crops. As more farmers take advantage of the extension program, their prosperity increases, and the future of the region is assured. Many of the projects undertaken through royal initiative begin here at the Chitlada Villa, residence of the royal family when they are in Bangkok. 
Apart from the formal gardens, the grounds have been given over to agricultural projects. The king has, in effect, established an experimental farm in the heart of the nation's capital. The stable can accommodate about 50 milking cows. As new breeds are introduced, careful records must be kept to learn how the cows adapt to conditions in Thailand. A pasteurizer, a powdered milk plant, and the milk packaging machine are an impressive demonstration of how farmers can form cooperatives to purchase the equipment with which to process their surplus supplies. The rice mill and warehouse demonstrate economical methods of preparing and storing this vital food. The king has been particularly interested in demonstrating alternate methods of milling rice so that valuable nutrients and vitamins are not lost. Innovative engineering ideas, such as this seesaw pump, designed to turn otherwise wasted energy into useful work, always find a place for testing and demonstration at Chitlada. Typical of the experiments carried out at Chitlada is this husk grinding and compressing project. The waste material from rice milling, when subjected to heat and pressure, can be molded into logs, which can then be used as a substitute for firewood. New varieties of fish suitable for stocking Thailand's inland waters are bred in these ponds. Several acres of the palace grounds have been plowed. New strains of rice and other crops are then tested before being made available to farmers around the country. Many government officials, farmers, students, and schoolchildren visit the projects at the Chitlada farm every year. The farmers are impressed with the practical ideas and solutions to everyday problems in rural areas. Yet, it is probably their king's personal involvement, such as his decision to conduct the experiments on the grounds of his own residence, that inspires them to take the ideas home and put them into action. One of the most serious problems facing Thailand is the destruction of the forests that cover the mountain ranges. These vast forests are vital to the protection of wildlife, and the preservation of the watershed. When trees and thick undergrowth cover these areas, precious moisture from rainfall is released gradually into the rivers and streams that flow down to the lowlands. But if the trees are felled, the water is released in sudden floods that erode the mountainsides and inundate the plains below. For many years, Thailand has been suffering rapid deforestation. Much damage is done by illegal log poachers who indiscriminately fell the great teak trees for quick profit. Additional damage is done, unintentionally, by the hill tribes that live in the northern highlands. For generations, they have roamed this rugged country having little contact with the lowland people, choosing to maintain their own language and customs. They practice a wasteful form of agriculture known as slash and burn. The forest is cleared and the trees are burned. The clearing is then used to plant the hill tribe's main cash crop, the opium poppy. This area of the world, which Thailand shares with Laos and Burma, has become known as the Golden Triangle, from the income derived from raw opium that is cultivated here every year. But not much of the profits from the illicit opium trade filters down to the hill tribe people who remain poor. 
As the poppies are growing, the peasants score the seed pod several times. They then collect the seeping resin from which the opium is extracted. When, after about five years, the poppy fields lose their fertility, the tribes move elsewhere, repeating their cycle of destruction. So, although these hill tribes are only a small minority of Thailand's population, this nomadic way of life has caused considerable damage. From their limited perspective, they cannot see the damage they are doing. King Pumipon has understood the importance of winning the confidence and cooperation of the hill tribes if the northern forests are to be saved. He has given his enthusiastic support to projects designed to help them learn a more settled way of life. Many reforestation projects are underway in the hills and mountains around Chiang Mai. Volunteer workers from the hill tribes assist with the projects. They settle in the deforested regions, planting and cultivating thousands of saplings of fast-growing species. The little trees become established and soon these barren hills will be covered with new growth. The king recommends a variety of trees be planted. Fruit trees, soft and hard woods, and bamboo. At the Pangda Highland Agricultural Research Station in Samong District, research is carried out to introduce cereals, fruits, and vegetables. In this picturesque valley, the hill tribesmen see that cash crops previously unknown to them can be grown effectively in the mountains. Wheat, barley, and other cereals have been planted, and the development carefully monitored. Strawberries and grapes are grown alongside traditional fruits and vegetables. Many other crops are tried, including cucumbers, beans, and coffee. Some adapt easily to the mountain environment. Others need more care. Fruit trees are planted and grafting experiments conducted to determine which varieties do well. Practical scientific research combines with the Thai's love of nature to give the project at Pang Da a park-like setting. Many similar stations have been established in districts that were formerly devoted to opium cultivation. They show the hill people that there is an alternative to their nomadic existence. Through the king's initiative, Many reservoirs have been built. With a steady water supply, fields can be irrigated and crop yields increased. Most of their majesty's projects are small in scale, but have far-reaching effects on the lives of the people. This hydroelectric plant harnesses water from the dam on its way to the fields. The small unit, just 10 kilowatts, brings to this remote village the previously unimagined luxury of electric light. Once the hill tribes begin to pursue a more settled form of existence, schools can be established and the children educated to take their place in Thai society. But not all the mountain people are convinced of the benefits of the crop substitution programs. They are not easily persuaded to abandon the habits of a lifetime. At Khun Pei, close to the Burmese border, representatives of several tribal groups wait in the morning sun. This is the day that could change their lives and the lives of their people forever. The farmers of Khun Pei are opium growers. The scanty crops from their irrigated rice fields cannot support their needs. 
to survive, they depend on the poppy as a cash crop. So far, they have not been eager to participate in the crop substitution programs. But now, they wait for a special visitor. His Majesty King Pumipon is coming himself to visit with them, to listen to them, and see what can be done to help them break out of the vicious cycle that is keeping them and their people poor. After greeting local officials, the king, accompanied by Princess Maha Chakri Sirindong, meets the tribal leaders. He listens carefully. The leaders explain that they're willing to stop growing the opium poppy, but first they must know how they will survive. Unless they have more water, they cannot grow enough rice. The existing water supply is insufficient to support them without the income they get from growing opium. The king always prepares thoroughly for a visit. He has studied this area. He has with him a detailed map that he has carefully marked. He has noticed that there are two possible sites for a reservoir. One is some distance away down the hillside in a rather inaccessible spot. The engineers do not favor it. They could only build a small weir that will not hold much water. A much better site has been found. This valley could be blocked and the resulting reservoir would hold enough water for the tribe's people for the foreseeable future. But the hill tribesmen do not seem enthusiastic about this. The king decides to see both locations. After a strenuous walk along the rough trails, the royal party arrives at the site with the irrigation engineers. They discuss the advantages and disadvantages. Now, the king leads the party back to the main road and on to the alternative location that has been proposed by the engineers. This area has already been carefully surveyed with proposed water levels marked and indicated with signs. The site is definitely preferable, but a dam placed here would flood much of the land that the hill tribes already have under cultivation. The king confers again with tribal leaders. First, they are nervous, but as the king wins their confidence, they begin to explain their worries. How will they be able to support themselves if their fields are flooded? These simple people have no experience of marketing a cash crop. The opium dealers pay them poorly for their opium. But if they abandon opium for fruit and vegetables, how will they get them to market? And who will buy them? After listening carefully to all sides of the discussion, the king recommends to his engineers that they look again at the lower, more difficult site. Once the local people feel the benefit of this settled way of life, he explains, they will ask for the larger dam and more water. It is better to go slowly so that permanent progress will be made. The engineers have learned to trust the king's judgment in these matters. His training and his 30 years of practical experience working with the people have given him the insight into the best way to resolve this kind of situation. 
The king and his daughter mix with the local people. They accept their simple gifts, a fruit, some vegetables, a piece of traditional embroidered cloth, even a puppy. They stay talking to the people until late in the afternoon. <laughs> Meanwhile, the royal medical unit that usually accompanies the king on these visits has also been busy dispensing advice and medication. It has been a hard but rewarding day for everyone. As the king prepares to leave, the people are reassured. They know that they have a friend in their king, a friend who really does care about them. While both King Pumipon and Queen Siriket have devoted much of their lives to helping the rural people take their place in the modern world, they have also encouraged them to maintain a respect for their traditions and cultural heritage. The graceful movements and ornate costumes of traditional Thai dancing are carefully preserved in modern Thailand. Professional and non-professional dance troops alike devote their time and talents performing these classical dances which reflect the traditions of the past. The royal family have been keen patrons of both Thai music and art. Like her husband, Queen Siriket realizes the influence her example can have on the people. She has chosen to wear distinctive styles made from traditional Thai materials. Through her example, the leading ladies of Thailand have gained a new appreciation for the silks and other fine fabrics of their native land. The preservation of Thai handicrafts has become a special interest for the Queen. She accompanies the King on his visits to all parts of Thailand. Wherever she goes, she asks to see the handicrafts of the region. Every part of Thailand has unique handicrafts made from the indigenous materials. The people eagerly show the queen the things they have made. Her Majesty examines a piece carefully. The rural people are generally skillful and talented, but sometimes the workmanship is not yet of the highest quality. The Queen encourages the people to produce only the best and to take pride in preserving the time-honored designs and techniques which are in danger of dying out. โดยที่มีครูสอนสวยปู
Queen Siriket realized some years ago that her interest in Thai handicraft had given her a unique opportunity to help the poor to earn an income while building their confidence and self-respect. In 1976, Her Majesty organized the Foundation for the Promotion of Supplementary Occupations and Related Techniques, known as the Support Foundation. Through support, Queen Siriket has discovered a way to combine her interest in reviving and preserving Thailand's traditional handicrafts with her deep desire to help the poor. Her Majesty can offer practical help to many of the poor, handicapped, and landless people she meets on the royal visits. Outside the village of Saint Pabon, a crowd of several thousand is gathered. In spite of the hot sun, they wait patiently in eager anticipation of the visit from the king and queen. They arrive with Princess Maha Chakri Sirindong. After greeting local officials, they begin to meet the people. These sisters are aged 101 and 108. They were born during the reign of King Chulalongkorn. Now they meet King Pumipon for the first time. Some of the waiting people have some very urgent needs and they are looking to the royal family for help. The Queen's staff go ahead to seek out those who have come for assistance. Sometimes a paper with their needs has been pinned to their clothing. Everyone is treated with compassion and respect. A number of people need medical care. The Queen asks that they be taken to an area where the team of volunteer doctors are helping those in need of attention. This little boy has been born without arms and legs. The family is poor and has no money or facilities to help him. He will be condemned to the life of a helpless cripple unless some aid can be given. The queen urges his mother to come to the support workshop. The skills she will learn will increase her income to help with her baby's education. ตัวนี้ทําสมแล้วเราขอขอลงมาขอลงมาขอลงมาขอลงมาขอลงมาขอลงมาขอลงมาขอลงมาขอลงมาขอลงมาขอลงมาขอลงมาขอลงมาขอ
แล้วก็ช่วยตุ่นไปอย่างนี้เราเลี้ยวตรงนี้ตรงนี้ทำเราจะเข้าไปโยกเล็กไปโยกโยกเขาไม่หายเอาไปถักแล้วก็ไปเผาเสียเดี๋ยวว่าคอยหน่อยช่วยในการทำงานจะรีบไปไปตรงนี้นะครับเราจะมาช่วยดูด้วย As King p u i p o n discusses an agricultural project with tribal leaders, Queen s i r i k i t and her daughter continue to talk with the people. No one is unimportant. No one must feel left out. Some men and women are landless, yet have several children to support. Many of the older children hope to go to a support workshop and learn a skill to supplement the family income. Her Majesty takes careful notes so that later arrangements can be made. Workshops have been established where the poor and landless can go for a period of training. These workshops are often located in the grounds of the royal residences, like the beautiful Puping Palace at Chiang Mai. The royal family use Puping Palace for two months every year as a base to visit the towns and villages of the north. When in residence, Queen s i r i k i t s youngest daughter, Princess c h u l a p o spends several hours each day personally supervising the workshop's activities. This uh, was a dying art because, uh, well, no one makes it anymore. But my mother found me very. Good shape of bear of my great grandmother, hundred years ago, and it still looks beautiful. So she tries to revive the old art. We've done this for ten years already. Poor people from some of the northern provinces spend several months learning the traditional skills under qualified teachers. These trainees are being taught the art of making realistic artificial flowers. These men are learning the silversmith's art. They progress from the simple stages to complex designs. Many of the workers reach a remarkable degree of skill. Even though this young lady is handicapped, she has overcome her physical disability to the extent that she is now a master weaver, able to produce top quality work and to teach others the skills that she has learned. After a period of training, many of the workers can return to their village, where they can continue the trade that they have learned. Some, however, like this silversmith, become master craftsmen in their new trades. Through the support foundation, they have developed their talents, producing works of art in the great tradition of fine Thai craftsmanship. Thank you. 
The main training center for the Support Foundation's activities is located at Bang Sai, 30 miles north of Bangkok, near Thailand's old capital of Ayutthaya. Landless families have been allowed to settle here. They are given a home and enough land to support themselves. At Bang Sai, many poor families have been given a fresh start. Hundreds of young people from poor farming families are paid a small allowance while undergoing a training course in vocational and handicraft skills. The woodworking shop is popular. During the training course, the students learn to combine power tools with hand craftsmanship. All students are encouraged to make useful articles of furniture. Standards are high. Careless work is not accepted. Each trainee is encouraged to be satisfied with nothing but his best. For the unskilled who have never made anything of quality before, it can be a struggle. But those who persist reach their goal and have the satisfaction of attaching to the work of their own hands the Support Foundation's emblem, the symbol of quality. Products that reach this level of excellence are sold in the exclusive Chitlada shops established at the initiative of Her Majesty to provide a means of marketing the crafts produced through the Support Foundation. In another section of Bang Sai, students learn the steps in casting bronze sculptures. In this method, known as lost wax casting, an original sculpture is made by the artist. Liquid rubber is then poured over the sculpture to form a flexible mold. This mold is now filled with wax. When the wax has hardened, the mold is peeled off and the wax form is encased in clay. When the clay is baked to harden it, the wax runs out, leaving the impression of the sculpture inside the mold. Molten bronze is now poured into the mold. After the metal has cooled, the clay is chipped away to reveal a rough bronze casting. This is now finished and polished by the artist to produce a fine work of art, identical in every detail to the original sculpture. These students are learning the elements of Thai design. First, a traditional motif must be faithfully copied. Next, the student produces an original. Finally, the traditional and original are combined in a unique design. The student has learned how to link personal creativity with the nation's cultural heritage. One of the most important ancient crafts being revived through the Support Foundation is Yan Lipao Fern Vine Basketry. The Lipao vine grows abundantly in southern Thailand. 
The stem of the vine is extremely tough and can be woven into baskets that will hold their shapes and literally last for hundreds of years. A skillfully woven Jan Lipau basket is a genuine work of art, of lasting value and beauty. This handbag belonged to the queen of King Rama V. It is still in excellent condition, although over a century old. Selected lengths of the cut vine are drawn through a sharp-sided hole in a tin plate until they are of uniform size. The size of the hole determines the diameter of the strand. The smaller holes produce a finer, more pliable strand, which enables more intricate work to be done. Weaving Jan Lepau basketry is a long process. To complete a handbag can take a skilled weaver several months. This basket is woven around a wicker frame of the required size and shape. With simple tools and endless patience, the exquisite basket work slowly take shape. Her Majesty is a great admirer of Jan Le Pau handbags and has been instrumental in helping many fashionable ladies